Everybody, welcome to Boston FinTech Week. I am not from Boston. I traveled up this morning from Atlanta, Georgia. I am a huge fan of this FinTech ecosystem. I've been fortunate to uh, have known them and had a relationship with FinTech Sandbox, I think going back about eight years now. Uh, we have a great asset in Atlanta called the Advanced Technology Development Center at Georgia Tech. Um, I think you all have another engineering type school around here, but in, in, uh, at Georgia Tech, um, this, uh, this incubator is, we're now 50 years old and we created a FinTech vertical in, um, in 2013. And one of the first partnerships uh, we were so fortunate to form was with FinTech Sandbox really to help our founders get access to data uh, in particular for POCs and that type of thing. So um, I was just thrilled to get the invite from the Wolf & Company team to, to be able to come up and help moderate this panel uh, in this discussion that we're, we've been looking forward to called um, Around roadblock, Roadblocks to Growth. Uh, and we've got a, a great group uh, of folks that, uh, some of which I know, some of them I've just been getting to know, who are just all great, deep experts uh, in a variety of areas of uh, compliance, assurance, um, and uh, third-party vendor risk management, and, uh, and fintech partnerships and banking. So I want to give you all the chance to get to know them a little bit. Uh, we're gonna keep the intros brief so we can get in the discussion. But uh, Ryan, I'm going to let you take this off first. Sure. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Roderick. I'm a principal here at Wolf & Company. I head up our IT advisory practice. And that covers a lot of ground. But relevant to today, what it mostly means is from, uh, from your perspective, maybe from a regulator who might come knocking at your door or a bank that you want to do business with, what are going to be their requirements surrounding IT security, risk management, some of the certifications or reports that you might need to be able to prove to them that your business is safe and sound and secure? So if it touches uh, computer systems, data of any sort, that's sort of my domain. We'll be talking a bit about that today, um, how you can handle that. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Palladino, and I sit in the Risk Management Services Compliance Department, and I my specialty is FinTech BSA, Bank Secrecy Act, anti-money laundering. So I have a, a banking background, grew up in banking, started as a peak time teller, made my way up to a bank secrecy officer, and I really like to, to just relate the two to the FinTech space and compliance and here to help. Hi, good afternoon. It's Soy Frott. Principal Wolf, um, I oversee our outsourced accounting and finance group. So everything from bookkeeping to virtual CFO services. Uh, I'm also one of our technology niche leaders and uh, working with, started my career working with emerging growth companies, startups. And Mike said 10 years, I think it's a little closer to 20 that we've been really working with technology companies. Think this works? Yep, this works. <clears throat> Afternoon, everyone. Chris Stanley, uh, I'm Senior Vice President of Payments and Technology at Georgia Banking Company in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I know Tommy well, and uh, that's kind of how I've ended up here. Uh, but my quick background is uh, I've been in technology almost 20 years now. Started out with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, actually started out uh, in the cohort or class here with uh, Mr. Leary several years, many years ago. Um, and during that time, Boston was kind of my second home, so it's really good to be back. But I left there in 2012 and really went to the company side, um, serving in kind of a CFO or whatever hat needed to be worn that day capacity, uh, which was raising capital, building inside sales team, raising equity, um, kind of all making payroll uh, on a Friday, all those fun things that the early stage companies go through. Um, the last of, last of those was a, a FinTech company, this is 2015, um, that was looking for bank partners. So it was my job, go around and talk to uh, various banks. And I remember sitting, you know, uh, there with the CIO SunTrust Bank at the time and saying, oh, you guys are the holy grail. And our new vendor uh, onboarding process, we just reduced from five years to three years. So that was great news when you're burning $300,000 a month. Um, so through that experience, kind of realized Atlanta didn't have um, a bank that understood payments and fintech. So to that end, in 2017, I joined a bank called Atlantic Capital Bank. Um, with one of my former SVB colleagues. And really we spent, you know, from 2017 to 22 building a pretty large payments and, and FinTech practice 
Um, it was national practice, companies all over the country. Um, you know, that ranged from on the more traditional looking side, payroll, a lot of mo money movement in payroll, some of which need FBO structures. Um, and then just fintechs, however you want to define, I'll define it as not crypto and not international for us. Um, anything else was, you know, fair game, uh, whether it's consumer, bill payment, corporate bill payment, you know, credit building programs, um, debt settlement, lending, um, you know, pretty much the full spectrum. Um, few, you know, a handful of companies you might know, Avid Exchange was one, um, Self Financial out of Austin, Texas, pretty big in the credit building space. Um, did that and then it was very successful to the point where we were acquired by a large regional bank who thought they understood our business, but we quickly found out they did not. So our team uh, searched for a new home and about 18 months ago ended up at Georgia Banking Company and similar playbook, working with companies around the country, high volume payments. Uh, we've done card issuance, we've done BASS, we're doing some merchant acquiring now. Um, so a little, bit of, a little bit of all of it. Awesome, Chris. Thanks, Chris. And, and just sticking with you for a minute um, here, Chris, to get our conversation moving, can you share as someone who is currently a banker and then has also been in that role as a fintech leader uh, engaging with banks, um, just a, a few of your like core lessons learned um, with each of those hats on, on how to make those uh, partnerships and relationships work? Hmm. Learned quite a few lessons. I don't know if I share them all here today, but um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, 2017 and probably before that, you know, sort of the wild west. It was right along with Bitcoin and everything else. Um, and, you know, probably one out of five prospect or companies you talk to understood compliance. Um, they knew it was something they probably needed to know about, uh, but they weren't terribly interested in it. Um, and in those situations, we'd refer them to, you know, folks like Wolf and others who do understand compliance and help get them ready. Um, today, I'd say that's probably reverse. You know, four out of five understand it very well and know that, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, top priority for the bank. Um, but even that said, um, they still don't come as prepared as they could, I guess. Uh, you know, they, they know they need the policies. They know they need, the, you know, they need the BSA, they need the AML, but it's still not, they don't come fully prepared. Like last week I was talking to a guy, he knew all these things, was spitting them off. Um, I said, good. He said, you know, understands this. And then I mentioned a sock audit and he kind of froze up. And I mentioned some reconciliation, which is subject of the latest uh, FDIC, FDIC approval, and our um, recommendation proposal. And, you know, his comment was, no, we know compliance is important, but what's really important is our customer experience. And so we're going to need you to, like, be that as frictionless as possible. And so to the extent you can have light compliance with us, that would be great. And so... There's still sort of that mentality. Is that a good thing to say to a banker? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite phone call was in 2017 when I answered the phone and he said, hey, I understand you guys do fintech banking. I need a FBO account to move Nigerian crypto. It was the very first phone call I got in the space. That did not work out um, for us. They are a unicorn in Africa now. Um, but, you know, so it's still, it's still top of mind. I mean, it's more top of mind than it ever was. Um, they still don't come fully prepared. And, you know, what's really nice and rarely happens is when a company comes to you and they say, I have all these things ready. Or if they don't have them ready, they say, I know I need them and I'm working on it. You know, we were talking about a little bit about this earlier. And that's a big help instead of getting a deer in the headlights look. And it only would have taken probably 20 minutes of preparation to not have that deer in the headlights look. Um, in terms of less, you know, what I've observed is it really, you know, like all things in business, it emanates or, you know, from the top down. So when the CEO or the founder is prioritizing compliance, that's when we tend to see the best results as opposed to, you know, go hire this expert that I know has to do compliance because I know we have to do it. And they may have hired a great person, um, but, you know, if you're not getting it from the top down, then it still doesn't really permeate uh, throughout the company like it should. So. Stop there. Awesome, thanks. And Christine, I want to just turn to you because as you're hearing uh, Chris mention these uh, experiences he had related to compliance and how to, that um, there's certainly a heightened level of awareness, but there can be, a, there's more to learn and the knowledge, the, the founders can be showing up with a greater understanding 
Um, help us understand like what you've been experiencing recently in the marketplace and how you're approaching your clients. Sure, yes. So some of the conversation that I have, I like to talk about, it's just better for everyone, I like to talk about three buckets of compliance. So the, the three things that I look for and I communicate with my fintech clients are, of course, there's compliance. Compliance is the first bucket. Second bucket is agility. Those two kind of work hand in hand. And then the third bucket is collaboration. So for compliance, of course, a robust framework and compliance, having your policy and procedures ready, even if it's just you know one compliance policy and then you're working on the others because you're not quite sure which, which reg you might have to follow. Um, another area is risk assessment, really understanding those risks and the threats, putting those down on paper and documenting them. And then also having um, SOC reports ready or any kind of audit that you may have gone through and I like to call this a due diligence package. So when I talk to my FinTech clients, I ask them, do you have a due diligence package ready? Some of them look at me like I'm, you know, a Darren Headlights. Some of them are kind of like, I have these documents, what do I do with those, right? So that's kind of my first bucket of compliance. The second bucket of um, agility is really just being aware of the regulations that are out there, but also understanding the regulations that are out there. So that way you can quickly adapt to the regulation shifts because we know that they're coming. We know that the guidance out there isn't solid. So just having that agile um, compliance uh, awareness out there and then being able to change your methodologies to adapt with the changes in the, reg in the regulations. And then collaboration. Collaboration is really doing what you're doing now, going out, talking to regulators, talking to industry leaders, talking to subject matter experts, keep telling them your problems, right? What, what are you facing? And then asking them how they're dealing with that. So really taking in all the information and then ask them for support, ask them what they do when they face a challenge and then write that stuff down as well. Cause it, as much documentation you can, you can all turn that into your due diligence package and then have a plan in case something comes up. So those are the areas I like to focus on. Um, Christina, are there, just as your time occurs to me, are there, are there resources you recommend to say early founders, to, to stay on top of things, or just begin to learn and to have a way to be aware. Uh, where resource, could you mention some that you might direct folks to? Yeah, I actually wrote down the number just in oh. case anyone asked. Um, so there is guidance out there and it's SR 24-5, which is the joint statement, um, interagency statement out there on third party risk. That guidance out there is, is really like a, a Bible of what to do, how to handle your third party risk uh, relationships from compliance standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, and just there's a lot of good guidance and um, step by step information in that. Awesome. Thanks. And then Ryan, risk management, something, something that is near and dear to your heart. Uh, tell us about um, when you when you hear that or you hear sort of these bits of the due diligence uh, package that Christina's talking about, like specifically with regards to that risk management, how these founders need to be uh, approaching it. Sure. It, it's interesting when we deal with fintech companies in particular. These are almost by definition, these are technologists. We're talking about engineers and innovators. Not, and they know software. For the most part, they know security. But coming from a banking perspective and the amount of security requirements imparted on them, uh, what they need to do to you in turn, sometimes will throw people for a loop. No matter how smart you are or how much you understand security, how to build an AWS environment with redundancy, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have all of the governance and compliance factors into place that can overlay or interweave through your technical security, right? So when we start to approach a, a fintech, oftentimes it's, it's at that last mile. They're about to sign a deal with you know, Wells Fargo, right? And they're about to be made but then they get this questionnaire and it's 800 questions of everything that do they do it or not. And now their head is spinning. They don't know whether they do these items or not. It is really, uh, we, we try to impart on our clients is as early as possible, as a couple of others already alluded to, understand what those requirements are because it goes beyond security in the traditional definition. It's not just cybersecurity, okay? It's information security writ large. So we have to work with them on information security and risk management writ large. That's everything from having documented risk assessments by some sort of defined methodology with you know, a heat map that spits out that you can attack then for remediation. It's having committees and boards and reports and oversight and policies and procedures 
All those things you don't always think about, but when you start to get more mature, they're absolutely essential to a well-managed information security program. So when you get that questionnaire from Wells Fargo or from your local community bank, you know, having worked with them, we know what, question, what answers they want to see from it. And often it's going to revolve around some sort of assurance report, like a SOC report, as others talked about. So when we do that, we're going to go out and say, well, where's your business continuity plan? Where's your incident response plan? And if you haven't thought about these things from early in the development processes because you thought you were great with your AWF, you know, suddenly you have so many things that we're going to try to bolt on at the last second. It's going to be inefficient. It's not going to work well. And if you have a well-educated buyer, they're going to see through it. So those are a lot of the challenges that we see that really can cause people to stumble at that 11th hour. And we try to avoid that as much as we can. So very interesting industry to work in. Uh, I do think it's improving, and I think Chris mentioned this early on, it's improved a lot since 10 years ago, but probably still a ways to go. You mentioned SOX. Um, can you talk, can you explain that a bit? I know it's an exciting acronym right. for you. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been, I've certainly worked in this space for most of my career. They come off often, and there's, a, I can always use a refresher on what's a SOC 1, what's a SOC 2, when do I need to start thinking about whatever the thing is? If you can help me with that, that'd be awesome. Um, so I'd like to explain to everyone the AICPA AT101 accounting standard, if you all like to grab a Mai Tai while we start. Um, so the basics of SOC reports, you have a SOC 1, which is about financial transaction processing. So if you're actually moving money for someone, a SOC 1 is the report for you. It's an independent auditor's opinion, just like a financial statement audit where we come in and sign our name to it. We do the same thing, but for your financial transaction processing controls. A SOC 2 is very much the same thing, except the subject matter isn't necessarily money movement. It's the internal controls you have around our information security. But at the end of the day, we're going to test them and sign our name to it. Right. Either one can have either a type 1, which is a point in time as of today, or a type two, which is a period of time uh, over the past 12 months, for example. Very confusing. There's a SOC one and a SOC two and a type one and a type two. They can mix and match, uh, but that's the gist of it. So I'm trying to sell my FinTech product to Chris. We think we had a question. Okay, yeah. Sure. It's in Australia, it's ISO 27001, is that the equivalent? I, ISO 27001 covers similar ground. It's the information we about management <laughs> system of an organization. That's more of a, a European standard. It's typically where we see ISO more popular. SOC is a little bit of a different bent, and the report itself is very different. SOC is not a certification. Okay, ISO 27001 is a stamp. You pass or you fail. Uh, a SOC report is a very detailed report that has pages and pages of what exactly happens in your control environment, and then we enumerate those controls and test them and give the results of the tests. So I, in my opinion, I think it's a little bit stronger. So as a founder, working on a SOC is not really what I want to be doing. Not, I know it's super fun. I know you love it. <laughs> not for me. I'd rather be you know, out with customers or figuring out what I'm going to sell, et cetera, or come out and go to market product market fit. Um, when should I start really working on this? You know, it, it, you know, it costs money too. Um, so like, when should I start putting money towards this, uh, this audit process? Um, help me, give me advice on how to handle that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can definitely take that. Cause we deal with this one frequently. Obviously the answer is the earlier, the better. Okay, I think no one's going to be surprised to hear that. But what's really the requirement here that you should be doing? You should, as early as you recognize that you're going to one day need a SOC report, start assessing yourself against the standards. That doesn't have to take a lot of time or money. Yeah, you can get the specific criteria against which you'll be assessed in a SOC audit. And you can start to do, at a minimum, a self-audit of do you have these controls and areas in place. You probably find you do not have many of the controls and areas of place and need to shore up some areas. Uh, then when you go out to solicit an auditor and schedule it and get it conducted, it's still going to be a fairly long process because remember a SOC 2 is a look back over a period of time. Even if it's a six month look back, you need to be absolutely 100% sure that those controls were in place and operating effectively throughout the six month period or 12 month period or whatever it is. So that can really extend your timeline. 
but at least you know you have the controls in place. If you're about to sign that contract and you've never even mentioned the word SOC report, suddenly we're trying to do a readiness assessment, we're finding all these gaps, you need to patch them, fill them, and then operate them for a period of time, and then have the audit, that's when you're talking about potentially at least a year or more to get a report in hand, which could be a big deal for getting a deal done. Is there a chicken and, a chicken and egg problem with uh, like a need to have volume before you get certified and then, or soft compliant and it, skipping you the volume kind of thing? Or? It, you don't really need to have volume. As long as the controls are there and operating, you can do it. Uh, but it's, it's not an easy process. I understand it's, it can be expensive and labor intensive for you, but again, just having the assessment in place, at least up front, will put you in a much, much better position when the time comes. Thank you. And this, um, so I, so I, I want to, you know, start to get smart with my company. I want to take your advice and begin to at least, um, um, you know, do my own sort of pressure test of ourselves. Like where would I find this? guidance um uh it, it is actually proprietary so talk to us uh, we'll, or any firm. we'll be able to get it for you um or do the assessment for you but it's not something you'll probably be able to find at the web all right so chris sorry Warwick, but so chris i i uh, i'm trying to sell you while well, we need some mic. um so chris i've got my awesome amazing fintech product that i want to sell to the georgia bank company um, and you trust me cause I've, you know, we've been to a lot of great dinners together. <laughs> so you've asked me if I have a sock one or two and I've said, no, is this, is it over? What it, what it was, is there any other, any other, uh, avenue for us to get into business together? So in that question, you said sell to the bank. So if it's a FinTech vendor, the bank's going to use a new tool or solution that's going to go through the bank's typical or standard, you know, vendor management process. Um, in that situation, yes, probably 90 plus percent of the time, you're going to need to have that. I mean, that's the bank's vendor management process they've been doing for years, standard across pretty much every bank. Um, so that's going to be looked for. Uh, if it's, you know, a FinTech partnership where the bank's going to be moving the money, um, if it's a true BAS relationship where your customers are legally my customers, kind of the same answer. Um, we're going to want to see that. Hopefully it's done. That shows like, a, you know, side of maturity like you guys are talking about. Um, or you have a very, very near term plan. It's already in process and you should have it soon. Um, but a lot of the companies we work with don't fit either of those two. Um, you know, we're moving the money, maybe an FBO account structure, maybe not, um, but their customers are not our customers. So the compliance burden is, uh, is a little less. In those situations, we try to take a risk, you know, risk-based approach. You know, a lot of banks out there um, and partners, you know, they have minimums. You have to have a minimum million dollars on, on your balance sheet the day you signed with us. You need to raise a minimum of five million from, you know, venture capital. So we've tried to avoid those um, just so that we don't box ourselves in from not working um, you know, with great companies. Um, and so in that situation, and this probably applies to, you know, any of the other things that we're looking for, but if you don't have it, a great answer is, you know, no, but we've talked to our board, we've talked to our attorneys, we've talked to our CPA, and, you know, we've got a plan and process to have that done by whatever, pick a date. Um, you know, you could say two years from now, just because you're trying to kind of push that out from the bank perspective. I might say, great, but we'd like to see it in a year. Um, and we do that a lot. You know, you can onboard now, but we want to see that within a year or, or whatever the time, or by the end of next calendar year, or whatever it may be. Um, so, but, you know, same goes for a financial audit um, or any of these, like, you know, if there's a list of 30 things you need, you know, 30 compliance items you need, if you only have 15 of those, if you at least have some answer to the other 15, like, yes, I'm aware of that. I know I might need it, depending on regs, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and we have a plan and, you know, in process, we have a plan to put those things in process as needed. That's a great answer. Awesome. Thanks. So I think that what I'm hearing there for those of you that are fintech leaders is that, again, getting to some comments that were made earlier, it's really important to know your partner on the other side of the table, kind of know your business and what that context is. Um, and just realize this type of, uh, 
audit is going to be important irrespective, but the timing could vary with some uh, depending on that circumstances. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah, so um, if you've got a SOC to debt as such, um, would that reduce your multiples in a VC capital raise? Would that scare them away? Um, what do you mean SOC to debt? So you don't have the... Oh, oh, I see. Most VCs, I don't think so. Um, they're focused on the other items, the up and to the right part of the story. Um, I have seen VCs come in and say, you know, you guys need to get your shit together. Yeah. Um, and, and we're, he, you know, we came into this at a later stage, growth stage investment, whatever it is, and we've seen these problems with other companies. And so, you know, they're saying, hey, you need to get this done. But... What I've seen and just conversations out there, I'd say most are like that. What about a trade sale? What's up? A trade sale. Selling the company. A trade sale. Oh, a trade sale. Yeah, yeah, I would think that would probably be important, yes. Yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, just a question of, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, other FinTechs selling like SOC, uh, Solutions, yes, like um, Thorough Pass, Trada, um, there's another big one I'm blanking on their name, Vanta. Vanta, thank you. And I, I've been told like they're 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 garbage, like like the 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 they you know, go through their platform, you may they may have a partner firm that will, will produce the sock, but it's not respected in the community. I'm curious what the panel thinks about the quality of of using these types of services, especially because they, they market heavily to fintechs yes. yeah. and other startups. Yeah, well, so we do encounter them fairly often in this industry more than others. And maybe I'm biased, but I certainly share the opinion that they're mostly garbage. Uh, frankly, what we see from those systems is a very standardized, generic list of controls that they will put out. And it's on the company to essentially mm -hmm stuff in whatever controls they do have to meet, meet that description and uh, upload evidence to it with the promise that it will then be a smooth audit. Does that happen in practice? Not often. Um, we, we've sort of intentionally stayed out of that space because the intent of a SOC is to be customized to each client. It's not a certification or a stamp. It's a detailed report of exactly what does in fact happen. And it may or may not meet the criteria, but that's all to be described. So. Uh, we've had a few instances where our prospects went to those companies and then a year later came back to us still not having a SOC report in hand. So that's buyer beware, I suppose. Can you talk about the costs, like relative to like, because I think Vanta will throw like, it'll cost you $40,000 with us and to get the attestation, but to yeah. do it right, maybe with you guys, is that like 80000 No, less than that, less than that. Um, they... I'm not sure what their actual software cost is, but they're, they're ultimately going to need to get a CPA firm to come inside it independently. I'm not sure how the relationship works there independently. But um, just to throw some ballpark numbers, we would never go in dry to do a SOC 2 audit for someone we've never talked to. It's gonna be problems. So we usually do a risk um, a readiness assessment first, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of say $15,000 to get you set up and make sure things are the way they're supposed to be. A SOC 2 type 2 audit, don't quote me here, it can vary tremendously based on a number of factors, but it's around $45,000. So it's, it's really not going to be tremendously more. Uh, but again, it, it certainly can vary depending on who you're talking to. I would say too, I think Matt Harris is going to be speaking tomorrow at the conference. And I know Bain's invested in a firm called Therapass out of New York. So be, I'd be curious to hear his answer if you ask him the same question uh, or just, you know, get his perspective on the side. Spot. Um, cool. The other, I think, key thing here that just we haven't touched on is um, around finance and the, 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 the finance work of the company, of creating a company and then as the company grows. Um, and really important to the overall, just, um, you know, really success of the company ultimately. So, Ceci, just talk, tell us about um, your advice uh, in approaching um, finance from the beginnings of the organization and then it has it matures. Yeah, thank you. So I think in working with a lot of startups and emerging growth companies, we see finance and accounting tends to take a backseat. 
uh, to some of the more pressing compliance concerns, but I would encourage you to think about it, you know, as you're building out your business and, and to think of it, not just as a cost center, a lot of, um, founders that I talk to think, oh, how much is this going to cost? And like, this is an overhead cost, right? But to kind of turn that around and think of it as a strategic partnership that can help you grow your business, right? Uh, can help you in your presentations to investors and um, really if you spend time in the early days setting up your accounting function, be able to report back KPIs, really understand the metrics that are driving growth within your business. So I, I encourage you to think about it as a strategic partnership and not to, not to necessarily put off um, the accounting setup work. Because uh, what we've seen is the value is really in, again, being a strategic partner, thinking through the KPIs. We've helped um, many clients think about um, more nuanced things like customer acquisition cost, right? Implementation time, implementation cost, when you're really pricing out um, your solution, your software, to really understand um, what, what the lift is, you know, wh where you need your pricing to be, uh, how long you want that customer relationship to be or to um, the payback period, right, of the customer relationship. So really digging through um, the implications of some of the early decisions you're making and how you're structuring your relationship with your customer. So I think it's it's thinking about finance as not necessarily just a, a check mark and, you know, pumping out monthly reports, but also a strategic relationship and how we can work together, um, you know, to help your company grow. The... Uh yeah, I even think of the, the just the financial model that so I'm looking for investors beyond my friends and family and I'm you know, gotten a sense of uh, my MVP and what I want that to look like. Um, is that step one? I mean, beyond maybe setting up with some QuickBooks or things like that to get the company up and running. Sure. We, I mean, we consult with companies at all stages. So it can be just, uh, you know, the beginning stages where we're reviewing a financial model. So if you don't have anyone in-house on your team that has, you know, a financial background, I think having, you know, a third party come in and take a look at it and really look at the assumptions within your financial model, uh, maybe lay on some uh, pro forma KPIs, kind of give a, you know, a, a sanity check on some of your assumptions, right? And just be all, all the more prepared, right, to pitch in front of investors. So I think you know, that's one of the things that we do uh, fairly frequently. And I also often hear a question from founders around, do I need a finance lead? Um, I mean, a, a CFO, that CFO position in my company, and, it, and if so, like when's the right time for me to bring that person into the fold? Yeah, it can, it can really vary and, um, I think Series B is typically where we see an in-house CFO come on board. Um, not a you know absolute, but kind of a general rule of thumb is where we see that happening. Um, but we also see a lot of different scenarios where there may be, depending upon the business and how it's structured, there can be um, it can be important to have people internally for high volume businesses, and you have a virtual controller or a virtual CFO to help you think strategically through your business. Um, so it just you know. The outsourced solution is is completely customizable and tailor made to what the the business needs, um, but certainly you know once you're Series B, Series C, that's where we typically see, um, not fully inside uh, accounting, but that's where we typically see the CFO come in. And if I'm a founder, knowing I need that type of help, um, what's your advice to me on how to find that help? Hmm. Uh, well, there, you know, in terms of um, an outsourced solution, yes. like Call Wolf and Company, who's the, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, you know, in, it's an interview process and a search process a lot like others, right? So I think um, there are a lot of solutions out there. The value in partnering with a CPA firm like Wolf and Company is that, you know, you don't have to question the accounting. You know, the accounting is rock solid. So it's, it's more about how we can help your strategy uh, how, how we can bring in other partners, right? Whether it's compliance, um, whether it's tax, right? So it's, it's being able to, um, you know, have a full service relationship with a firm, I think is a real um, added value. Awesome. Thanks. I'm, I wanted to kind of ask one or two questions and get the, a perspective from each of you. Um, and the first was, is what, um, what's a habit you encourage 
fintech leaders to practice uh, from the from their earliest stage of uh, forming their company to in in the uh, with the outcome, of course, of helping them reach a success. I think I'll take it since I have the mic. I think you know some of the best relationships that I have with founders and CEOs are, are based upon regular ongoing communication. So it's carving out time to talk on maybe not a daily basis, but weekly as to connect on what's going on within the business. Um, and it's not just relegated to finance. It's, you know, come with your problems. Tell me what's going on within the organization. We work with a lot of companies like you. So whether or not, you know, generally all roads lead back to finance somehow, it's going to impact <laughs> whatever's happening is going to impact the financials. But um, I think it, it's, uh, it's a good way to, to vent, to get the issues out, but also to, to talk to a strategic partner that has may have seen it before or have a resource right for you. So I think communication is, is big with all of your vendors. Sure, I'm gonna add continuous learning to communication. So not only staying informed of the regulatory environment landscape that's out there, but also to foster an environment within your own culture and really have a culture of innovation, curiosity to have those big ideas because then that will also help you pivot when the regulatory landscape will change and also come up with new service offerings that could be another successful um, opportunity down the road. Um, I kind of said in terms of, you know, topic of the day in terms of compliance, just having that top down, you know, I remember one CEO, every time we go on the phone and, you know, what's broader group from the bank, we'd always emphasize, look, we're compliance first. You, you, you always said it too much, but, Clients, people never get get here uh, tired of hearing that. Um, and I guess one thing I just thought of, you know, we're talking about all these things as they apply to early stage companies. But I've worked with just as many companies who are large established, very profitable companies, where you have this exact same conversation. You know, they just they've got a large they've got large customer base. You know, throwing off a lot of cash, and they've decided, hey, if we get in the revenue or if we insert ourselves into the flow of funds, we can create a new revenue stream. Uh, create additional stickiness with our clients, et cetera. And so this is just as new to them. Um, and so while we're talking about early stage, uh, this applies to what the company I talked to last week, you're doing 200 million revenue and you know 50 million of EBITDA and the exact same conversation. I mean, they take it, they're probably, they probably tend to catch on a little quicker. Oh, I need to take this seriously, but they still need most of the things we're talking about. Yeah, All right. What I always like to emphasize is build a strong foundation and do it early. You tend to think of security and compliance as how can we just check that box and get on with what we actually do. But most of these controls and these requirements, they're not done out of spite. You know, we don't do it for fun to make your lives harder. They're items that are supposed to make you a better business if you implement it right and do it well. Okay? You'll be more secure, you'll be more resilient, you'll operate more effectively, you'll have the foundation to be a larger, well-operating company instead of trying to build it in midair later on. So, you know, take it seriously early and try and get the real value that you can out of it. This is an example, think third-party management, vendor management. You know, if you do that right, you might catch yourself in a bad contract. Maybe one that auto renews and costs you an extra $50,000 of burnt cash, right? So those are things that you should be well aware of. And we have you know, products that will automate that. They'll send you a warning if your contract renewal phrase, phase is about to come up. So those types of systems that you can implement can really come back to save you money, or even if not uh, that direct one-to-one -one financial, it'll make you a better business and prevent mistakes down the line. All right. Awesome, thanks everybody. Um, questions, we got a couple of minutes before we wrap, but, but uh, I know we've had a few great questions. Any, any other burning questions out there? It's always a little harder when we ask her questions. Yes. Well, first off, I want to tell you a great job moderating because my question was to you in regards to, um, sorry, great job moderating. Um, cause Stanley, my question, remember your name. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, was in regards to like, because uh, I remember early stage pre-seed ideation founder wanted to actually have a conversation and that you have individuals pitching from, um, want to provide financial services as far as, you know, figuring out your projections and everything. And I considered it, it was very expensive, but I felt like that would have been a waste of money considering early stage founders typically got to go through a processing, pivoting, and so forth. 
So um, from your perspective, where do you actually start with that process or <clears throat> where would you consider founders to start? Because you mentioned Series B, but from my perspective, is it more of a, like a C, Series A? And I think early stage founders need very specifics <laughs> on where we need to allocate our resources from that perspective, just to double allocate. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for the question. So I'll clarify. Um, so Series B was when we see most folks have a, an internal CFO, like a full-time CFO at Series B. So before Series B is where it's fair game for a fractional or virtual CFO, right? Uh, so very common. And it's really at you know, foundational kind of stages where you're building your business model that we can start to consult with you and help you on your business model. Um, I'd say most of our recurring month-to-month um, -month, you know, um, customers are at least, they've raised some seed capital but certainly have consulting engagements with folks that just you know want us to look at their financial model as they get started, or consult here and there as they get started. Yeah, one more question in the back. Thank you. To follow up this answer, what I would like to understand is, for example, in the case of financial model, we have to set up pricing. So at early stage, we do benchmarking, benchmarking and so on. So how we transition from the benchmarking to a real one, like real pricing analysis. Is it like seen when we have a support like yours or how you see that? I would, I would add, and another country heard from, um, in, this year we decided to reimagine how we sell to the FinTech space. We have 77 lines of service that we market to the fintechs, but really because of our DNA in the early stage uh, startup space, we, we fractionalized. So instead, instead of having to buy, buy a $40,000 BSA audit, you can get three hours a month of Christina's time just to start the wheels turning. We did that with our, we have a, a virtual chief security officer service, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for you, you don't do as much as the, of that hourly work, but certainly can start small to build up. Um, I know we're, we're starting to think about doing like quick low cost gap assessments uh, to really get a good understanding of your financial um, function and, and what we would recommend. Yes, okay. I was just going to make a comment on the timing. From my perspective, and I've been COO of a few FinTech startups, so to my mind, you revisit the pricing when you've got a couple customers and you've got market feedback. So that would be the timing. And then you engage Wolf and Go or somebody mm -hmm. to then figure out how to do it, but the timing should be when you have market information to, to reconfigure. Awesome. Yeah, very good. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I have a quick question about talk to you mentioned uh, looking back into the past um, like six months 12 months uh, just looking at that like how far you said we should create that talk to as soon as we can but at the same time we're looking back 12 months in the past how is that game played and then also how often should we update talk to and talk one and all that stuff yeah great question so the SOC 2 by nature has to be retroactive we're looking at things that actually happened and testing them so we have to look into the past the duration, the term is whatever you want it to be. Typically it's 12 months. Okay, so normally we're looking back from, the, we'll call it July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. And then we're gonna do July 1st, 2025 through June 30th. So you'll always have coverage throughout the year. However, the first time you do it, you might not wanna wait 12 months. So that's where the type one comes into play. Maybe on June 30th of 2024, that, well, this already passed. Okay, 2025, June 30th of 2025, you say, I wanna put a stake in the ground now. I'm gonna test my controls as of today, and I don't care what happened on June 29th. But then you have a report that's not as strong, but at least gets you started. You put the stake in the ground, and thereafter, every 12 months, you can do a type two. Hey, what else? Well, great, thank you. Oh, to, in the back, yes. Yeah. Drilling into that on the uh, SOC 2 Type 1, what do you do when you're very early stage? Uh, like, as you're 
pivoting your pivot, your, your business model and your technical foundations? Ooh. Very early stage where you're changing your technical foundations. Yeah. It hurts me to say it, but I might suggest not doing it just then, okay? You need to have something in place that's, A, auditable. You're going to have policies, procedures, something formal that we can look at uh, rather than an idea or something ephemeral that's changing. And also, by the time we give you your report and you in turn give it to your customers, your prospects, you want it to still be valid. If things are changing constantly, you're probably not ready for a SOC report yet. But we should start the conversation at least so we know when the time may be right. And it depends on why you need it. Like, you know, what, what audience are you, are, you, are you shooting for? So. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much to the panel. Thanks for all of you for being here. Thanks for all the great questions. And uh, we'll all be here. So if any of you got any additional questions for us, please uh, just come up on the stone. Thanks, Mike. Back to you. for our panel. Just one last, uh, I, I was serious when I said we like to serve the markets. Uh, we like to give back to the markets we serve. Um, not everything has a price tag on it. So you can, you can just simply send an email to info at wolfandco.com. I left some cards out there. We often do one hour workshops that are no charge where we can have a more personalized session based on you know your reality and kind of like we know already what some of the gaps are going to be for SOC 2 audit we know you don't have a risk assessment that follows the NIST uh, 800-53 standard we know your business continuity plan probably isn't up to snuff or your incident response so we can give you those high level gaps in what we would recommend you know, internally, kind of, uh, you know, uh, at a time that the timing that makes sense for you. So please reach out. We're happy to set up those calls, and um, whether it be around SOC two, bookkeeping, regulatory compliance, privacy, on and on and on. So thank you very much. Uh, we're still going till five o'clock. So feel free to. Um, partake in some beverages and food. Thank you again.